Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see you all back in the house of the Lord, and it's such a wonderful blessing to be here once again on this beautiful Sabbath day that God has blessed us with. Thank you, our sister Vanessa, for that wonderful song. That was a very, very beautiful song. Thank you for sharing that with us. You know, many times on our journey, we have all questioned and asked the Lord, how much longer is it going to be, Lord, before you finally come back? How much longer, Jesus, will wickedness continue to run its course? And as we look at our spiritual GPS today, the Bible, we can see that we are really truly living not just in the last days, but the very end of the last days of this earth's history. Everything that's going on around us is shouting out to us, get ready, get ready, get ready. Jesus is soon to come. And today, we're going to take a look at the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And we're going to see just how far we really are from home. And what we need to be doing not only to prepare ourselves, but our families, our friends, and others also to be translated when Jesus comes back the second time. And we're going to discover that the second coming of Christ is not as far off as some of us actually think it is. That it's much closer than we ever thought than it's ever been before in the history of our world, especially since Jesus ascended back to heaven over 2,000 years ago. But before we get started, I'd like all of us that are physically able to do so, let us kneel and pray and seek the Lord's face, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, we humbly bow ourselves before you this Sabbath day. And we ask that you would speak to our hearts in a special way, that you will give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church, and willing hearts and minds to obey and to put into practice what you say to us. We ask that you would banish Satan and his demons out of our midst in the name of Jesus, that the spirit of lethargy and drowsiness will be dismissed by the holy angels that are here present with us. And we ask that you will speak to us and help us to be in tune with what you have to say to us this day. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask this and pray and thank you. Amen. I'd like us to take and turn our Bibles once again to John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. We're going to open our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And when you're all there, please say amen, okay? Okay. And John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, we read... Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, Jesus tells us, are how many mansions? Many. many mansions. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. And he goes on to tell us that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, who's the one that's preparing the place for us in heaven? Jesus, that's right. He's been preparing that home for us for quite some time. And he's eager to come back to get his people, to take us to be there with him for all eternity. Let us no longer prolong the misery and the suffering and the agony in this wicked, corrupt world. But let us do all that we can within our power by surrendering to the Lord, 
so that we can hasten Jesus' return and finally go home where we belong and sin finally be done away with forever. Isn't that our desire? That all the wickedness, all the corruption, all the things that we've become accustomed to in this life finally be done away with so that we can live in a life free from sin, a life free from that liar that is responsible for the misery and destruction and the woe and the desolation that has wreaked havoc in our world since the fall of the Garden of Eden? Does anybody know what the original Greek definition is for the word troubled found there in John chapter 14, verse 1? As I mentioned, heaven is a place where Jesus longs for us to be. But we must be willing to sacrifice all to gain heaven. We can't hold on to anything in this life and expect to gain heaven if we're not willing to give all. Jesus gave all for us. So let us be willing to give all for him. The original definition for the word troubled in Greek and John 14, 1 is this. It comes from the word tareso, which means to strike one's spirit with fear and dread, to perplex the mind of one by suggesting scruples or doubts. Many times the devil comes to us and says, Wow, if God really loves you, then why are you facing these difficulties? Why are you having these struggles? Why were you struck down with cancer? Why do you have this? Why that? Why are you having to lose your job? Why has your family turned their back on you because you chose to walk in the light of the truth? And we have so many questions. And we wonder why all these difficulties and all these perplexities are coming upon us. We've looked at our description of home. But now I want us to take a look at some signs of the times that tell us just how close we are to Jesus' return. And we're just going to look at a few of them because if we were trying to look at all of them, we would be here all month trying to just cover half of the things that are going on in this world today because the signs are so obvious and things are happening so quick, so rapidly, that there's not enough time in the day to try and explain everything that's going on that shows us just how close we are to Jesus coming back and how far we are from home. So let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 and let's look at verses 9 to 13. Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 to 13. When we're all there, say amen, okay? Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 to 13. And look at what Jesus tells us. This is just a few of the signs that Jesus tells us that would point to the nearness of his second coming. In verses 9 through 13, we, we read, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my sake. And he goes on to say, Because, and many false pro wait, excuse me, verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Do we not see these very things happening before our very eyes in the time and day which we live in? Parents are leaving their children and families are, sadly, some families are even killing their children, children their parents. Wives are walking out on their husbands and leaving their children because they want their freedom and husbands are doing the same. Children have no respect for authority or parental restraint to such a large degree in the world that we live in today. And we could go on and on and on with all these difficulties, all these things that are going on in the world. But Jesus said to us, remember, 
You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. These are very troublous times that we're living in, brethren. And it's only going to get worse as we draw closer to the second coming of Jesus. If anybody tries to say, oh, things are going to improve, they're going to get better. They haven't read their Bibles aright if they believe such. Because we are told that a time of trouble is coming that has not taken place since there is a nation upon the face of the earth, nor shall that ever be after that time. But God's people will be saved out of it. We will have to go through the time of trouble. But you know what? Just as Daniel and his friends went through the fiery furnace, who was with them in that fiery furnace? Did they go through it by themselves? No, Jesus was right there in the midst with them. And so Jesus and the angels will be with us if we will just hold on and run the race with endurance, setting aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us, and running the race with endurance, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith and of our salvation. Faithful is he who has called us and who has begun a good work in us and he will continue it until the very end if we will allow him to do so. Let us turn our Bibles now over to Luke chapter 17. And let's take a look at just a few more signs that Jesus gave us concerning the nearness of his return. Luke chapter 17, we're going to start with verse 26, and we're going to read to verse 30. If everybody's there, please say amen. amen. Okay. And Luke chapter 17, verse 26, notice what Jesus says to us. He said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What all were they doing in the days of Noah anyway? They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage. They were living up the good life. They were living life as if it was just going to continue on. All the way until Noah entered into the ark. How long was Noah in the ark before the flood even came? Seven days. And they still continued to live their life like nothing was going to change, that nothing was going to happen. And they didn't realize that the end had come until it was too late and the flood came and destroyed them all. But you know, there are some other things that took place during Noah's time as well that we have the tendency to overlook that we fail to forget sometimes. One of those things was the animals that entered into the ark. Did Noah have to run out and tell the animals, hey, come on, come on, get into the ark. God's going to destroy the world by a flood. No. God put it in the minds of those animals to enter into the ark and they all came with one accord, and they entered into the ark of safety. And this puzzled that long-lived race of the antediluvians. And they couldn't explain from scientific viewpoints why these animals were entering into the ark. But the one thing that they did try to tell the people was, Oh, wait, we, we can't explain why these animals are entering into the ark, but we know Noah's not right. He's a fanatic. The world's not going to be destroyed by a flood. The world's not coming to an end. And once those animals entered into the ark, an unseen hand closed Noah and his family and those animals in. And for seven days, it didn't rain. And then all of a sudden, rain started to fall. And then people began to question, could Noah have been right? Could it be true that God is actually going to destroy the world by a flood? But it was too late. And so today, in our time and day, there are hundreds, thousands, millions of these animals and creatures that are just dying mysteriously. They can't explain from a scientific viewpoint why this phenomenon is taking place. But you know the one thing that they are saying? They're saying the same thing they said during Noah's day. Oh, well, we can't explain this strange phenomenon but we do know for a fact that it's not the end of the world, so don't worry, the world's not coming to an end, like some of these fanatics are trying to say. Another thing that happened in Noah's day, <coughs> excuse me, was they tampered with the species. They tried to play God. And I just recently read an article a couple of weeks ago 
and the UK, they're talking about doing the same thing, taking human DNA and putting it into fetuses of pigs and other types of animals for the sake of harvesting human organs. And this was one of the main things we're told in the spirit of prophecy that brought down the wrath of God upon the antediluvian race because they were crossbreeding. They were trying to play God. And this brought God's judgments and wrath upon them. And so the same thing is happening today. In Lot's day, they were buying, selling, trading, eating, drinking, living it up, living the good old life, and didn't know that the world was going to be destroyed by fire and brimstone. We read that in verses 28 to 30. And sadly, Lot and his family didn't really believe that God was going to destroy the world by a flood either. And so they had to be dragged out by the angels even to be saved. And the angels told them, do not look back. But Lot's lingering attitude caused his wife's heart to remain in Sodom. And what did she do? She turned back and she became a pillar of salt. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're holding on to the things of this life, if the things of this life are more dear to us than Jesus and Him crucified and the hope of His return, we may end up finding ourselves like Sodom and like Lot's wife being destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming instead of being translated. There is nothing worth holding on to in this life and losing eternity with Jesus. Jesus gave up all heaven for us so that we could spend eternity with him. Let us be willing to sacrifice all for him. We all remember what happened last year with the torrential rainfall that we had in this state, do we not? Never in the history of Texas, they said, has all four of the major cities of Texas been flooded at the same time. They say an estimated 35 to 40 trillion gallons of water fell upon the state of Texas to cover the whole state with eight inches of water. Texas is a huge state, and that's a lot of water to be able to cover the whole state in eight inches of water. That's just one of the several signs of the nearness of Jesus' return. And we also know what happened June of last year with the Supreme Court's decision. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that the Sodomites and those inhabitants of Gomorrah were very wicked and licentious above all the inhabitants of that area that Lot dwelled in. And so, it's the same today. On June 27, 2015, the Supreme Court, we know, legalized same-sex marriages in all 50 states. And this was phase one of a two-phase process, my brethren, that is to take place not just here in the United States, but throughout the entire world that will make God's law, holy law of love and life void in the entire world. And David says, they have made void thy law, Lord, it is time for thee to work, to stand up. And very soon, God's law is going to be made void, not just here in the United States, but the entire world. And when that day comes, where will we be found standing? Will we be found standing hidden in Christ? Or will we be found without a shelter in this storm that is to break upon the world by many taken by surprise because they have not sought refuge in the ark of safety, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and soon coming King? Some of the other signs were told that the time of trouble, such as was not since was a nation, is right upon us. And we are like the sleeping virgins. We are to awake and ask the Lord Jesus to place underneath us his everlasting arms and carry us through the trial before us. The world is becoming more and more lawless. Soon great trouble will arise among the nations that will not cease until Jesus comes back again. And so here we see also the ransom of the Lord on the straight and narrow path. It's a narrow, rugged path. But the good news for us is, as Jesus has gone before us to smooth the path out for us. And though it is rugged and it will cost us everything to follow on this path, let us be willing to sacrifice all that we may gain the heavenly treasure 
because only those that are willing to sacrifice all will gain the heavenly treasure. There's nothing that we can hold on to and take with us if we want to gain heaven, brethren. In an article from U.S. Today in October of last year, the Department of Justice has been talking about what they're going to do to cut down on extremism. But the question we want to ask ourselves is, is what is the DOJ classifying as extremists? Here are just a few things that the DOJ considers to be extremists. Those who teach and advocate end-time Bible prophecies, those whose doctrines and beliefs are not easily characterized, and look at this, number three. By the way, if anyone would like to look more into this information, you can go to the Southern Poverty Law Center website, and you can look at what they have called a hate map, and they have various groups of extremists that they consider to be hate groups, and there's one that's called a general hate group, and this is what they consider a general hate group. Those that are anti-Catholic <coughs> or anti-Jewish or anti-Muslim, and especially those that are anti-Catholic that, of course, teach the Pope is the true Antichrist, a Bible prophecy. And look else, what else we're told here. So we're told we need to draw fresh supplies from the great storehouse. But before I jump ahead of myself, we just looked at some of the few things that show us just how close we are to the nearness of Jesus' return. So now we want to see what we need to be doing to prepare ourselves for Jesus' return. And we're told here in the spirit of prophecy, we need to draw fresh daily supplies from the great storehouse of God's Word. That means that we should be spending time in the Scriptures because it's only as we spend time in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that we can prepare ourselves for the time that is about to break upon us and not be deceived with the rest of the world. She goes on to say that this will give no time for novel reading or for anything else that does not edify and strengthen for every good work. The riches of heaven are at the command of God's children. Every day the tempter will be on our track with some delusive, plausible excuse for our self-serving, our self-pleasing. The one whose heart is wholly given to God, the only, or the one who by faith receives Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, will reveal a steady growth in spirituality and vigor of piety and a fixedness of purpose and fidelity at any cost to the principles of faith. And so, there's an article that was released by Amazing Facts. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to summarize it. The American Bible Society, usually every year, they put out a survey, and it's titled The State of the Bible. And they conduct the survey to determine what the belief is about the scriptures in American society. For instance, this year, not this year, 2015, excuse me, 88% of households own at least one Bible. It says the average home has at least four copies, and many consider the Bible to be a sacred text, whereas 10% consider the Torah to be sacred, 7%, and the Book of Mormon, 4%. But it says this percentage has drastically dropped. In 2011, it was 86%, but in 2015, it was 79%, as considering the Bible as sacred literature. And the other thing that they found out is that half of Americans strongly agreed that the Bible contains everything a person needs to know to live a meaningful life, but little over half believe that the Bible has too little influence on our society today. But here's the most telling question of all, brethren. Very few read the Bible. 52% read their Bible at least three to four times a year. Just one in seven read it every day, and one in four do not read it at all. And one in ten read it once a year, and one in ten read it maybe twice a year. You see the decrease in the interest of spiritual things in our society and our culture? In such a time and day in which we're living in, we need to make sure that we are spending quality time with the Lord. 
What is true, we are busy, we have jobs, we have families, we have responsibilities and obligations. But we should not put those before the Lord. If we're putting those before the Lord, we're preparing ourselves to be set up to receive the mark of the beast instead of receiving the seal of God. Plain and simple, cut and dry. If we neglect our relationship with Jesus, how can we expect to come up to that time when our, the mark of the beast is enforced and the death decree is passed and say, oh, well, we wait till that time and try to make a decision? We'll make a decision, but we'll most likely make the wrong decision because we haven't been doing what we need to be doing to prepare ourselves to make the right decision. For example, Daniel and his friends, when they came to Babylon, you know, they had to journey by foot. They didn't have the luxury of planes and boats and automobiles and everything like we have nowadays. So it took them probably at least a good half a year, if longer, to get back to Babylon because that was like a 1,000 to 1,200 mile journey. And they were taken into the University of Babylon and all the luxuries of the king was set before them. And we read in Daniel 1 that Daniel, as well as his friends, they purposed in their heart that they would not defile themselves with the portion of the king's meat or with the wine which he drank. It was in that small test that prepared them to be loyal for the more larger test. I have a question for us. If they weren't faithful in that small test, would they pass the test in Daniel 3 and chapter 6 when their lives were put on the line for their faith in God? No. If we're not passing the small test in our lives that God is aligned to come upon us, are we going to be able to pass that more severe test when the mark of the beast is enforced and our lives are put on the stake for our faith in Jesus? No. We'll end up being among those that end up accepting the mark of the beast instead of rejecting it. And so, we need to spend time in the Scriptures. We need to truly believe in the Bible and the sacred Scriptures and the spirit of prophecy as a whole. And not picking and choosing what we want to accept and then casting everything else to the side that doesn't harmonize with our ideologies and the modern trend and culture of today that we live in. And if we are doing that, you know, we could actually be doing turning a blind eye to our Heavenly Father's will and excusing our indifference in our coldness and our rejection of what God is trying to say to us, which is done in deliberate defiance. If we are choosing deliberately to be defiant, can we gain heaven? No. We have to be willing to submit. Submit is the prerequisite for making it to heaven because it's only by we submit to the will of God that we can gain heaven because that's when self is lost sight of and Jesus increases and we decrease. Look at this here, what we're told. There is too much coldness and indifference. Too much of the I don't care spirit. Oh, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what God says. I don't care what so-and-so says. I don't care what Ellen White says. That's not for our time. It's outdated. It's, this is a new time. This is a new day. This is a different culture. That's not for modern day. That was for then, not now. But look what she says. All should feel a care for one another, jealously guarding each other's interests. Love one another. Then should we be able to stand a strong wall against Satan's devices. Some of us are tempted to work on the Sabbath, and some of us are actually working on Sabbath. And we excuse the fact that because maybe it's in the medical field. Oh, as long as I... And it is true, we shouldn't neglect the sick and the poor and the needy. That is true. But we're also caught and counseled, excuse me, in the spirit of prophecy, that if we work on the Sabbath, that that our money that's earned on the Sabbath, that that whole amount should be given to the Lord and not used for our own purposes. But how many of us truly do that, though? We have to sacrifice all for Jesus. And then there are some of us that have lost our jobs and our employment because we've chosen to remain loyal to God and not work on the Sabbath. And then... There are those that have lost our families. They have turned their backs on us and they don't want to have anything to do with us because they think we're part of a cult because we choose to walk in the truth of God's word. And then there are those of us that think that constituting keeping of the Sabbath just means coming to church. And then after church, we can go home and do what we please like we do any other day of the week. But look at what we're told. Those who discuss business matters 
and lay plans on Sabbath are regarded of God as though they engaged in the actual transaction of business. To keep the Sabbath holy, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of a worldly character. Our minds should be stayed upon Jesus during the sacred hours of the Sabbath. By a show of hands, how many married people do we have here today? If we don't spend time with our spouses, what's going to happen to our marriages? They're going to begin to fall apart and deteriorate, are they not? And so God gave us the whole 24 hours of the Sabbath to spend with Him, to get better acquainted with Him, to have a deeper, firmer relationship with Him, and not just to come to church for a few hours and then go do as we please and want the rest of the Sabbath day. The whole Sabbath is to be spent in an intense relationship building with our Heavenly Father so that we can be prepared for the coming crisis that's going to come upon us. And we are going to be tested, brother, by the image. Look at this here. It says, The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who will prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. So what we are doing on Sabbath is determining which seal we're going to receive. If we want to receive the seal of God, we have to be willing to truly keep the Sabbath holy and call it honorable, a delight unto the Lord as he counsels us in Isaiah chapter 58. And not just doing it for a few hours every Sabbath at church. It's the whole 24 hours, brethren. And the family, the family life, is the most important thing in this world. Ellen White says that when it comes to the missionary efforts, that we're supposed to start within our inner circle, our family, our immediate family, and first start there and then branch out to everywhere else. But how many times we neglect those within our inner circle and branch out more and Go here or go there or go overseas or do this. There's nothing wrong with missionary work. Don't get me wrong. But we have an obligation to our families first to make sure that they are in right standing with the Lord. And then we're to go to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And look at what she says. Every family should rear its altar of prayer, realizing that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If any person's and the world need the strength and encouragement that religion gives. It is those who are responsible for the education and training of children. They cannot do their work in a manner acceptable to God, while their daily example teaches those who look to them for guidance that they can live without God. If they educate their children to live for this life only, they will make no preparation for eternity. You know, to a large degree, the way that we bring up our children determines whether they're going to make it to heaven or not. And to a large degree, whether they make it or not, is the type of example we are setting on a daily basis in the home life. So we have a great responsibility upon our shoulders. And you know what? We can't do it without Jesus. It's only by submitting to Jesus that we can know how to rightly raise our families. And some of us are tempted to want to be more concerned with the things of this life and the materials of this life. And we're so caught up with all the temporal things of life that we don't have time to spend with the Lord. As you see the man wondering, well, should I follow Jesus? Are as riches and wealth more important to me? We must remain faithful to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with riches. There's nothing wrong with wealth. It all determines on how we use it and if we allow it to become a God to us or not. Because remember, God is the one that gives us the power and the ability to get wealth, to do His will, and to help further His work, and not to be used for our own selfish purposes and ends. 
And many of us spend more time in front of the TV than we do anything else in the world. And we want God to bring revival and reformation into our lives and into our families and into the churches. But yet, we go home and we turn on the TV, we laugh at their off-color jokes, and we do what they do. We watch what filthy garbage Hollywood puts out. And we're not even sensitive to the sin of it, and yet we expect revival and reformation to take place in our lives. The first and foremost priority needs to be Jesus. And if anything that we're watching isn't in conformity to what God considers to be acceptable, then we shouldn't even set any evil thing before our eyes. We're cautioned that in the Scriptures, that we shouldn't set any wicked thing before our eyes, because Paul says, by beholding, we what? we become changed. And he also goes on to say that evil company corrupts good matters. By what we see and what we hear determines what character we're going to have shaped in us in this life. And the character we develop in this life is the character that will be with us throughout all eternity. If we develop a Christ-like character, we are assured we will make heaven. But if we do not develop a Christ-like character in this life, we can't be assured of heaven because we have not submitted to Jesus. Here's an illustration I'd like to share with us all. A young lady bought an iPad, and when her father saw it, he asked her a question. He said, what was the first thing you did when you bought it? The young lady replied, I put an anti-scratch sticker on the screen and bought a cover for it as well. She replied, Dad said, did someone force you to do this? No, of course not, she chuckled. Do you think it was an insult to the manufacturer? No, Dad. In fact, they even recommend using a cover for the iPad. Did you cover it because it was cheap and ugly? Actually, I covered it because I didn't want it to lose its value or get damaged and decrease in value. I wanted to protect it. But when you covered it, didn't it take away from the iPad's beauty? I think it looks better, she said, and it's really worth the protection it gives. The father lovingly looked at his daughter and said, If I had asked you to cover your body, which is more precious than an iPad, would you have readily agreed? The young lady understood. But what about us? Do we understand that our bodies are of great value and price to our Heavenly Father, and that we should possess them in in glory and honor and in sanctification, we need to do everything that God has called us to do and do that which is pleasing to Him at all times and not follow the customs and practices of the world. We're told that the customs and practices of the world are eating out the heart and soul of God's people. Which is more important to us, being Christ-like or being like the world? We need to be like Jesus and not like the world, brethren. And we're suffering so much in this life. There's so much difficulty, so much perplexities that many of us are going through. Like I said earlier, lots of us are going through some very tremendous, troublous times, trying times. Some of us are still even without employment because... They require us to work on Sabbath and we refuse to violate God's holy Sabbath and choose to remain loyal to Him. Some of us, as I mentioned, our families, they have forsaken us. We've lost our jobs. Some of us are tempted to have to take an exam or our finals on Sabbath and are told that if you don't take your finals or exam on Sabbath, we're not going to give you another day to make up on it. And there's the risk of losing financial aid because you refuse to obey what man says. And then others, out of fear, they choose to go along because they're afraid of losing their jobs, because they're afraid of getting behind on their bills and fail to realize that God is their provider and not the employer. Look at what we're told right here. And I want to encourage all of you, brothers and sisters in Christ, hold on to Jesus. Don't let go of Him. There may be some of us here today that are on the verge of turning our backs on the Lord because we wonder why all these things are happening. We wonder, does God love us? Does He care about us? If He really does, then why is all this happening to me? It's not because God doesn't love you. Look at this. 
It says, Jesus is always the same in his human tenderness, combined with his divinity, always touched with the feeling of our infirmities, using divine, his divine ministering attributes to do us good, always encouraging, guiding, leading us on step by step. Jesus promised us that he will be with us all the way, even unto the end of the world, that he'll never leave us, never forsake us. If it seems that the Lord has forsaken us, brethren, it could be because there is known sin in our lives that has caused us to separate from God, and we're unwilling to let go of it. She goes on to say that he is unchangeable. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he is to us today, a faithful high priest, touched with the feeling of our infirmities. This will he be tomorrow and tomorrow forevermore. He is a guide to lead, a teacher to instruct, a friend to counsel, a donor to bestow his blessings upon his church in response to their faith. Oh, how many in this time of peril are making a hard pull against a head sea. The moon and stars seem to be hidden by storm clouds, and in despondency and despair, many of us say, it is no use. Our efforts are as nothing. And you know what? That is right. Our efforts are absolutely as nothing. John 15, 5 says, we can do absolutely nothing without Jesus. If there's something that we're struggling with in our lives, if there's something that we're finding difficult to let go and to overcome, give it to Jesus because he can and will give you the victory. Friends, every time I've tried to do something in my own strength, I have failed and I've utterly failed and never have been successful in doing anything without Jesus. None of us can overcome in this life without Jesus. But through Jesus, Paul assures us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And she says, we have toiled at the oars, but without any success. But look at this, brothers, sisters. Jesus is just as near to us amid scenes of tempest and trial as he was to his followers who were tossed on the Sea of Galilee. We must have calm, steady, firm, unwavering trust in God. Excuse me. We must now have an individual experience in holding fast unto God. Christ is on board the vessel, brethren. Believe that Christ our captain, that he will take care not only of us, but also of the ship, and we will make it safely into the harbor. The scriptures tells us in Hebrews, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense and reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the pride, the promise. For yet a little while, and he will, that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And look at this other wonderful promise the Lord makes to us. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But... It is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire that their what? Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected in us. So just because we're facing hardships and difficulties and trials, it's not because God loves us. He loves us with a love that is stronger than life, brothers and sisters. And he sees something in us worth perfecting or he wouldn't waste his time on us. And God does not create junk. Not one of us here is without value in God's sight. And he sees something worth perfecting in us. And this is why these difficulties are allowed to come upon us. To get us to let go of self and to cling to Jesus so that Jesus' perfect character may be fully reflected in us. We're all familiar with this poem, I'm pretty sure, Footprints in the Sand. And I'm pretty sure every single one of us can put ourselves in this situation. One night a man had a dream. 
He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord across the sky, flashed scenes from his life. For each scene, he noticed there was two prints of footprints in the sand. And one belonged, of course, to him and the other to Jesus. But when the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him, and I'm pretty sure it bothers us as well too. And we question the Lord about it, and we say, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the time, the most troublous times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, Jesus, where were you, Lord? Why would you leave me alone to face these difficulties by myself? Jesus replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. I love you more than life itself. I would never leave you during your trials and suffering. When you see only one set of footprints, it was because at that time, I carried you. Brethren, please don't let go of Jesus. Hold on to him. Hold on to him with all your might, all that you have. Hold on to him and don't let go. Another important thing that we need to realize is prayer. Prayer should not be involved in spasmodically or at a field time basis. We should always be in an attitude of prayer. It tells us that prayer is the breath of the soul, the channel of all blessings. As the repentant soul offers its prayer, God sees its struggles. Look at this. He watches our conflicts. He marks our sincerity. He has his finger upon its pulse, and he takes note of every throb, not a feeling, thrills it, not an emotion agitates it, not a sorrow shades it, not a sin stains it, not a thought or purpose moves it, of which he is not cognizant. That soul was purchased at an infinite cost and is loved with a devotion that is unalterable, brethren. Prayer to the great physician for the healing of the soul brings the blessing of God and unites us to one another and to God and brings Jesus to our side and gives new strength and fresh grace to the fainting, perplexed soul. Another thing that we have to be willing to do is to allow the Lord to give us there some of us that are struggling with appetite. We need to be willing to allow the Lord to give us the victory over appetite. You know, that's the one sin that has led to all the other sins that has been committed in this life since the fall in the Garden of Eden is appetite. It was so strong, Jesus had to fast 40 days and 40 nights to gain the victory over it for us. And so we're told here that we should be willing to do away with everything, especially flesh, because it is stimulating and it causes almost as universally diseased and is doubly objectionable and it tends to irritate the nerves and excite the passions, thus giving the balance of power to the lower propensities. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have in you, and you're not of your own? You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God with both your body and your spirit, which are God's. And as we mentioned a while ago, we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Run the race with endurance, because we have need of patience, that after we've run the race, we may receive the prize, as we read in Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews 13, Jesus promises us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is with us. Let us stay close to his side. He's our only safety. Look what else we're told in the spirit of prophecy. The mighty shaking has commenced. 
and we'll go on and we'll all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God in his cause. The angel said, think you that they will be compelled to sacrifice? No, no, it must be a free will offering. It will take all to buy the field with a pearl of great price. I cried to God to spare his people, some of whom were fainting and dying. Then I saw the judgments of the Almighty were speedily coming, and I begged of the angels to speak in his language to the people. Said he, all the thunderings and lightnings of Mount Sinai would not move those who will not be moved by the plain truths of the word of God. Neither would an angel's message awake them. I then beheld the beauty and loveliness of Jesus. His robe was whiter than the whitest white. No language can describe his glory and exalted loveliness. All, all who keep the commandments of God, all ten of them, brethren, will enter in through the gates into the city and have rights to the tree of life and ever be in the presence of lovely Jesus, whose countenance shines brighter than the sun at noonday. And so Jesus asks us today, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is how we show our love to our Lord, is by being obedient to him. And remember what we're told in Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to enter into the tree, into the gates of the city, and eat of the tree of life. And so, every drop of his blood was shed for us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Every step that he took to Calvary's hill, every humiliation, every strike, every whip, those nails that pierced those loving hands and feet, it was done for us, and we were always on his mind the whole step of the way. He could have chose not to die, that death on the cross that we deserved to die. But he knew that there was no other way. And as we've seen, the return of Jesus is much closer than it's ever been before, and we are closer to home than ever before. Let us be willing to set aside every sin and every weight that so easily besets us, and to let go of everything that we may gain heaven and eternity with Jesus. Let us give our hearts anew to Jesus today, so that if he were to come back tomorrow, we can enter into heaven and be with him throughout all eternity and not hear the hurtful words, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. If we make it to heaven, it's because we want to be to heaven. If we don't make it to heaven, it's because we don't want to be there. The choice is ours. How many of us were to give our hearts and our lives anew to Jesus this day. Let us kneel and pray and surrender anew to Jesus and allow him to perfect his character in us so that we can spend eternity with the one that loves us. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the great sacrifice that he made in our behalf. Lord, we pray that we will be more willing than ever before to sacrifice everything in this life for you. That we'll be more willing than ever before to stop following the practices and the customs and the culture of this modern world that we live in today. That we'll no longer allow ourselves to think that it's okay to do this or to do that or to live any way that we want just as long as we confess that we've accepted Christ. Lord, help our profession line up with our, help our lives to line up with our profession and help us to let go of every sin that so easily besets us so that when Jesus returns, we may meet him in peace and not hear the hurtful words, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Lord, draw us nearer to your side than ever before. And I pray, Lord, that we will be willing to allow Jesus to truly be Lord of all in our lives, in every single area and all aspects of our lives. For we ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.